Thanks for checking out this week's podcast from Center Street Church. We pray it blesses, encourages, and inspires you. You've seen them, the sharers. Those who share every one of their meals on Instagram, every holiday on Facebook. I have this friend who is definitely one of them. She had a bran muffin for breakfast and is training to run a 10K after work. She's not alone, you know. We really do like to share. This past weekend, my pastor challenged us to share our faith story. Immediately, my heart started to pound. Breathe, just breathe. He obviously doesn't mean me. I'm sure he's only speaking to those with theology degrees. And then he says, someone needs to hear your story. My story? Hmm. Maybe I don't need a degree to share how Christ changed me, really changed me. There is this fear that people will think I'm pushing something on them. But honestly, that's not it at all. My faith is the most important part of who I am and I do want to share it with those in my life. And it's not just about words. It's about how I live my life, treat my friends, my family. It is about listening to your friend's story as well. Hear that? My heart stopped pounding. You know, he's right. Someone does need to hear your story. Well, last week, if you were here, Ashwin kicked off our summer series where we are exploring different facets of Jesus' invitation to us to follow him. And so over the next seven weeks, we're going to be building and elaborating on the passage that Ashwin spoke on last weekend. And specifically, he focused on three verses, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. This is what Jesus says. This is the grand invitation. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. All who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the great invitation to every human being to come to Jesus, to follow him. And the first invitation, the first way this is experienced is to, is when we come to Jesus and follow him, we experience rest in our souls. And this rest is a deep abiding peace within us. Shalom, this deep shalom, this deep abiding peace with God in relationship with God and also in relationship with people around us. And the second aspect to this great invitation is to take responsibility, to be a disciple of Jesus. And a disciple of Jesus or a follower of Jesus strives to represent Jesus to the world around us. And so this invitation from Jesus has both its benefits and its privileges and also great responsibility. This invitation is open and expressed to every single person on the face of this earth, but yet every single person has to make a personal response to Jesus' invitation. Come to me. And so we're going to explore aspects of this great invitation over the next seven weeks of the summer here. But this weekend at each one of our campuses, our campus pastors have the opportunity to share with our campuses their testimony of following Jesus. So I have the privilege this morning of sharing with you some aspects of my journey as I have been striving to follow Jesus these 37 years. And specifically, I want to focus on three realities that Jesus has taught me as I've sought to follow him. And my prayer is that as I share with you what God has done in my life and what God has taught me in my life, my prayer is that your faith will increase and grow in Jesus. My prayer is that you may notice in a new way how Jesus has been at work in your life as you've strived to follow him. And my prayer as well is that you will be encouraged, you'll be given courage to follow him more faithfully. So many of you know that I grew up as a missionary kid. When I was one year old, my parents moved to Cameroon, West Africa, 
where my dad was working alongside Cameroonian pastors and Cameroonian church leaders to just grow the church there. And as a result, I grew up with an awareness of God. I grew up just knowing that God was real. Acts chapter 17, Paul says this to the, to the Greeks that he was speaking to. Paul says, God is not far from each one of us. God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And I feel like this verse describes my life because I've always been aware of God. I've always felt like God is near to me. I've always known he's real and present. And I knew about God from the conversations that we had in our home around the supper table or breakfast table or devotional times that we had as a family. I knew about God and his activity and his power in the world by the stories that my dad would tell us of churches and what was taking place in churches around Cameroon and West Africa. I knew about God from going to church regularly myself. I knew about God from reading the Bible and having the Bible taught to me. And so in my early years, an anchor for me in my life, a deep stabilizing force in my life has been that the Bible is true. That the Bible is absolute truth. And this is the first reality that Jesus taught me. The Bible is true. But sadly today, certainly outside of the church, and unfortunately within the church as well, confidence in the Bible is at an all-time low. Many Canadians no longer believe that this Bible, this book, is God's word to us. Our society in general has a disregard and even disdain for this book. Some Christians question the trustworthiness of the Bible, the reliability of the Bible, and many Christians don't have the confidence that this book is a Holy Spirit-inspired true revelation from God to humanity. But I believed the Bible is true. You see, to follow Jesus, you must believe the Bible is true. It's impossible to be a follower of Jesus and to, and to not believe that the Bible is true. And simply because this book, most of this book, was the same Bible that Jesus had when he was alive and walking on this earth and that he believed in and that he quoted from and that he felt was authoritative in his life. And when you come to the New Testament, the evidence for the New Testament as being the inspired word of God is convincing. Jesus says this himself, mankind does not live on bread alone. We don't find our life, our sustenance for this life on bread, on food alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And these are God's words to us, the Bible. We need to live according to them. And so from my early years, I believed that the Bible is true. I believe that the Bible is the guiding authority over this world and all of humankind because it's the primary source of God's revelation to us about him. And so obviously as a young child, I wouldn't have communicated my belief in the words that I just shared with you right now. Obviously, I wouldn't have done that. But from a very young age, I had a very keen sense of what was right and what was wrong. What was right and what was wrong, and that came from the Bible. As a child, when I did what was wrong, boy, the Holy Spirit just provoked my conscience, and I did not have peace until I confessed what I'd done or just tried to make it right. But I knew that God loved me. And I I knew that Jesus died for me, for the wrong that I had done. And I knew that I couldn't make all of my wrongs right. I knew I needed help. I knew I needed a forgiver. And so when I was about four years old, I prayed and asked Jesus to forgive me, to come into my life, to live in me. And I genuinely, as a child, wanted to follow Jesus. Believing the Bible is true gave me confidence in my early years to know that there were other gods that were not the one true God. You see, growing up in Cameroon, there were witch doctors and there were tribal gods and there were people believed to possess evil spirits who had power and there were other spiritual spiritual forces and spiritual dynamics going on that I knew were in direct opposition to the God revealed in the Bible. And I saw ways in which the God revealed in Scripture was more powerful than any of these other would-be gods. I'll share with you one story. 
I had the opportunity to go with my dad and a few others to a um, dedication of a church building in a remote village in Cameroon. A year earlier, a pastor from a neighboring village had come to this village just sharing Christ, teaching about the scriptures, teaching about the Bible, trying to look for someone who would be receptive to this gospel message that he was bringing from this other village, and he was doing that regularly. And over time, a few people began to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. And then the chief of this village, a person in authority, right, believed in Jesus, surrendered his life to Jesus, and then he led others who believed in Jesus to burn all of their idols and icons of, of false spirituality and false gods. And, and over time, most of the people in this village became followers of Jesus. Just a testament to God's power and the power of the gospel message and the truth. And so we were there that one weekend where there was this church dedication that took place. It was a long worship service. It was about four hours long. And a part of this worship service was the dedication of the church building, and thank you, God, for that. And part of it was baptisms as well, and then we had like a normal worship service that was long, and then feasting afterwards. And I remember falling asleep that night, and, uh, and there were still people dancing and singing and celebrating, praising God for his goodness and his power and his authority and what he had done. And my experience proved to me that the God that I read about in the scriptures was real. And so I believed the Bible is true and real. Believing the Bible is true in my early years helped me make sense out of death. When I was three years old, one of my good friends was hit by a car. He was crossing the street, saw our car coming, froze, and was hit by this vehicle. And he died. When I was... 10, a friend that I had who was older than me was in a car accident and it appeared he would be just fine. He walked away from the accident but had internal injuries and ended up dying late in the morning. A missionary kid, a friend of mine, drank something that poisoned him. I, pr I remember praying for him to be healed and God to heal him, but, but he died as well. And then when I was 11 years old, there was a natural disaster that took place. And after the first service, some friends from Cameroon, new friends actually, came in and just reminisced about, and they knew about this disaster that took place in Cameroon um, when I was 11. And, and because of tremors along a fault line, carbon monoxide gases that were trapped in the bottom of this lake came out of this lake and erupted out of this lake, flowed down a river, a river valley, and, and the gases from this lake killed almost 2,000 people who lived in villages along this river. And a pastor who worked with my dad and who lived in one of these villages came to seek my dad out for help. And I remember him sharing his story with us. This pastor was asleep one night and he woke up in the morning and was confused and had some burns on his body and felt like he couldn't breathe very well. And as he walked about his home, his wife and his daughter weren't present in the home. And there were six individuals in that home who died that night. He walked, saw, he walked outside of his, his, his home and he saw just dead bodies and the horror around him. And he walked onto this road and began walking, trying to seek for help. And a taxi came and picked him up and this pastor then took, made the six-hour journey to our home to ask my dad for help, to help him find his wife and his daughter. So the next day, a few of us got into a truck and we drove to a clinic nearby one of these villages. And there we found his daughter. And she was healthy and alive and she was recovering from her injuries. And then we went to this pastor's home and we dug a mass grave. We buried these six uh, individuals in this grave and had a ceremony. And, and then we continued on to another hospital where thankfully this pastor saw his wife and she was alive and well and recovering and being treated for in, her injuries. Now, it would be an understatement to say that I didn't sleep well that night or the following nights. That night, I probably asked Jesus into my heart to come live in me and forgive me a hundred times <laughs> just so that I would be sure that Jesus knew who I was and how I felt about him and, and I was, had assurance of where I would go when I died. But that experience combined with friends who I've had who have died have taught me early in life that death is real the death is normal, 
And my belief in the Bible, that the Bible is true, taught me that after life, after this life, after death, there is life. And this life is either with God, present in his company, in community with him in heaven, or after this life, there's a life that exists completely apart from God, completely apart from his presence in a place called hell. And this Bible, this book, the Bible has taught me that Jesus died so that we could experience life with God in this life, right now in this life. And then when we die, we simply pass on to life for eternity with him. The Bible taught me this, so I believe the Bible is true. In my experience, and then later on what I've learned about the archaeological, the historical, the biblical, the rational evidence concerning the scriptures has convinced me that the Bible is true. And really, it's the only book that has the authority to help us make sense out of life and what we experience. I've learned in following Jesus that this book, the Bible, is true and dependable and a book of authority. The second reality that I've learned in following Jesus is that following Jesus requires a decision of our, of our will. It requires a decision. And you'll remember how I just mentioned that at four years old I made a decision to, to just ask Jesus to forgive me and come into my life. When I was 14, I decided to be baptized. And that was a, a public declaration of me saying I want to follow Jesus. It was a way about me making this, this decision and proclamation on my own. This was my faith. But then when I was 15, I went through an experience that I say was my passage into adulthood. And it also was an experience that solidified again my decision, my desire to follow Jesus. You see, from when I was 11 to when I was 17 years old, I lived in a different country every single year of my life. And when I was 15, I lived in Nigeria, in Joss, in boarding school. And I've met some of you from Nigeria, and you know Joss, and you know this school that I went to. There were 17 of us, uh, young people who were living in this home with house parents. There were four of us guys who lived in one room. And we were all in different grades, and we got along really well, which is probably why we got into a bit of trouble with each other. And the way that our house parents found out that we were doing things that we shouldn't have been doing was because our teachers discovered that we were falling asleep regularly in our classes. And so our teachers talked to our house parents, who then began their own investigation into our lives. And so one day when we all got home from school, we were called in one at a time and had a conversation with our house parents. And you know what? We confessed to everything that we were doing. We were sneaking out occasionally of the house after everybody had gone to sleep. And we would go to a local restaurant and eat what we called soya, which is just beef on a stick. And uh, at times we would go to a, a party. And we were doing other things we should not have been doing. We were absolutely wrong. Being disobedient, not honoring God, not honoring our parents, not honoring our house parents. We were doing wrong. So as a result of this, we were all put on probation for the rest of the school year. We weren't kicked out, but put on probation. Now, all of this took place two weeks before Christmas. And so for our Christmas break, all of our parents took the two-day journey from Cameroon to Nigeria to come pick us up. My dad was coming to pick me up. And I so desperately wanted to talk to my dad as soon as I saw him and just tell him what we did and ask him for forgiveness and make things right. But for whatever reason, he said, no, Kent, we're going to wait, <laughs> which was just agony for me. We're going to wait till we can talk about this with mom and I. That's what he said. So we made the two-day journey back to Bamenda, and then we took a, another day journey down to the coast, and we finally sat down together, had this conversation. And my mom was crying, and I'm sure I was crying, and my dad, tears in his eyes as well. We talked about everything. And then my dad said this. He said, Kent, we have tried our best to raise you in a way that honors God. We've tried our best to instill in you values, to instill in you teaching from Scripture and just helping you to follow Jesus and follow him wholeheartedly. We've done our best to raise you to be a young man. 
But now the reality is you are two days drive from us. And you've already made decisions that you have to live with, the consequences of. And when you go back after Christmas, you'll have the same freedoms and you'll have the same opportunities to make decisions because we won't be there to parent you. And you're on your own. And now you have to make a decision about how you're going to live your life apart from us as parents because we can't be with you. You're going to have to make this decision of how you will live your life and you will live with the consequences and our prayer and our desire is that you would honor God and you would just continue to live how we've raised you to be as a young man. And that conversation, that moment, has shaped the whole of my life. Because that conversation and the moments and the days after that led me to once again just surrender my life to Jesus Christ. It was a time when I determined that Jesus would have a say over everything that I did and that he would be the one in authority over me and I would strive to follow him wholeheartedly. And I wanted to live my life under his leadership. And the next months of school were quite different for me. Following Jesus requires a decision of your will. It requires you make a decision. And I thank God for the challenge that my dad gave me that, that day. Because from the time then that I was 15 years old, I didn't live at home again until I was in my early 20s. See, following Jesus is a choice. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, and Joshua is speaking to the nation of Israel. And these words are so relevant for us today. Joshua says this, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living now. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, following Jesus requires a decision. And if serving the Lord doesn't seem desirable to you, then which God will you follow? Who will you follow? Who will you live in submission to? There are many other things that attract our devotion, other things that attract our commitment, other things that attract the affections of our heart. And it requires to follow Jesus every single day, making a daily decision to follow him. Every single day, you have a choice to make when you roll out of bed and your feet hit the floor. Who will you serve? Who will you serve? And there will be moments along the course of your life that are large, defining moments, defining conversations that you have that you, just, you say again, yes, I will follow Christ. I will follow him wholeheartedly. But every single day we make decisions. Following Jesus requires a decision of your will. In following Jesus, I've learned the Bible is true. Following Christ requires a decision of your will. And the third reality that I've learned in my life in following Jesus is that Jesus speaks to me. Jesus speaks to me, and Jesus speaks to you. If you want to know what God says, first of all, we only have to look to this book because there's really not a lot of mystery about what God says because this is, this is full of what God says to us. But God also speaks to us in inner promptings and through a picture or an image or, or his whispers into our heart, mind, and soul. Jesus speaks to us in this way. And I have been a slow learner at hearing Jesus speak to me. So many times I'm busy or preoccupied or after the fact I recognize and say, oh yeah, that was God by his Holy Spirit speaking to me and I missed that completely. But one of the most significant times in my life when God spoke to me was when he told me that I would marry Nadine, who is my wife today. You see, I had just met Nadine the summer before and we spent about a day and a half together with mutual friends in Edmonton and then after that brief time that we spent together, I went off to seminary down in the States in South Dakota, and Nadine was living in Calgary. And so during the season of my life when I was at school in the States, I was praying and asking God, God, if you want to speak to me, if you want to say something to me, then just get my attention, right? Just grab a hold of me, speak to me. And I was even praying, saying, God, if you want to say something to me at night, then wake me up. Right? Just do what you have to do to speak to me. Wake me up even. And so, 
On March 25th, 1998, I was sleeping. I was asleep, fast asleep. And the door to my room blew open. Now, I don't remember if there was something wrong with the lock of the door, or I don't remember that, but I do know that I closed the door, and the door blew open. And so I put a towel over top of the door and just pushed it into the door jamb to just help it stay shut for the rest of the night, and I went back to sleep, and the door blew open again. So I put the towel over again and, you know, put it over twice and then pushed it into the door jamb so it would stay shut. This is a true story. Went back to sleep, and the door blew open again. And then it kind of hit me. Maybe God is trying to wake me up and speak to me. So I, what I did was I just, I sat up in bed, got out my journal, and just said, okay, Lord, if you're trying to get my attention here, then you've got it, and just please speak to me, because I'm listening, and I just want to know what you have to say to me. And immediately this thought was impressed upon my, my heart, my mind, that I was going to marry Nadine. And I didn't know what to do about that. Because <laughs> I was in South Dakota, and I had no plans on coming to Calgary or anywhere in Canada. And she lived in Calgary at the time. And we had just begun emailing each other. Yes, we had email in 1998. It just kind of come on, right? New thing. And we were emailing each other briefly intermittently, but I didn't really know who she was. And I still have in my journal written today these words. I think God told me I'm going to marry Nadine. Question mark, question mark, question mark. So I didn't know what to do with what I'd heard. And so I just kept this in my heart, didn't tell anybody, and just pondered it and just trusted God with that. And so wouldn't you know it, the next school year, I ended up moving to Edmonton. Nadine ended up moving to Edmonton for completely different reasons. We began dating, and um, over the course of our dating relationship with two breakups in there, and that's a lo- longer story than we have time for today, in, in 2002, we were married. And, and I go back to this story often in my life to remind me that God is faithful and that Jesus wants to speak to me. And he did speak to me. And he still speaks to me. And he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to you. On a side note here, if you are a young man or a young woman and you feel that God has told you that you're going to marry this person, I wouldn't recommend you go tell him that. (laughs) At least not right away. (laughs) And just, you know, trust God with that and ask him when you're supposed to tell them, right, that God told you you're going to marry them. Don't do that right away. (laughs) I didn't tell Nadine. Well, God told me until after we were engaged, which was about three and a half years after he spoke these words into my life. I didn't tell her that. Because sometimes God speaks to you, and what he says to you is just for you. Just for you and not for anybody else. Just for you to ponder, you to reflect on, and you to ask God, what do you mean by this? And sometimes what he'll speak into your life won't take place for years and years and years and years. And you have to just go back and say, okay, God, you spoke this into my life, and I trust you with this. And the circumstances of your life might even reveal to you or or show you that it's almost impossible that this would come about. But God speaks, and so trust him with what he's spoken into your life. But sometimes, just like happened to me a couple Wednesdays ago, God will speak something into your life that is for you that very day or even for the next day. God spoke something into my life that was confirmed by my wife for me to do just the next day. And I've learned that Jesus speaks. He speaks through his written word to us, the Bible, and he also speaks through his his whispers, his spoken word into our life. So what I've learned from the time I was four till I'm 41 now, so these 37 years, has been the same. I continue to believe that the Bible is true. The Bible reveals the truth. It is absolute truth. It's authoritative in this life today. 
The Bible reveals who God is. The Bible reveals who you and I are. The Bible reveals why we're here. The Bible reveals the truth about Jesus, the truth about salvation, the truth about the Holy Spirit, and the Bible reveals the truth about what will happen to us when this life comes to an end for us. The Bible is true. I'm still choosing each and every day to follow Jesus. We each have the opportunity each and every day to say yes to Jesus or say no to him and dishonor him. So I'm trying to remember each and every day as I get out of bed, I surrender anew again and say, okay, Lord Jesus, today you're my Lord. I want to follow your leadership. I surrender to you. And for the past three months, Jesus has been speaking to me about trusting him, about trusting him. And if some of you in this room are having a, just a, a hard time trusting Jesus, there's a song that's been of great encouragement to me. I listen to it almost every day driving into work. It's by Aaron Keyes. It's, it's Trust You, Jesus. Trust You, Jesus. I love hearing Jesus speak to me. Because when he speaks a word or a phrase or a sentence into my life, it has an effect on me like nothing else. It energizes me. It focuses me on what matters most in my life. I depend on Jesus speaking to me. And I know you do as well. So I want to close our time together now. And just allow us all a few moments of silence. We sang earlier in the service, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And I trust that God's Spirit has been speaking to you. How are you doing at following Jesus these days? How are you doing? Maybe there's some of you who have not made a decision to follow Christ. Decide today. Decide today. You can do that. Ask Him to forgive you for what you've done wrong. Ask Him to come and live inside you and just say, Lord, I want to surrender my life to you, Jesus. How are you doing at following Jesus? How are you doing at trusting him? Maybe God's spoken something into your life and you've been, you've been delaying that. You've, you, you've been holding out on, on responding in what Jesus has spoken into your life. Well, respond today. So I want us to spend about a minute and a half or so just in silent prayer. So join me in praying. And like we do, just if you feel comfortable, hold out your hands. It's just a physical way of saying, Jesus, speak to me because I'm ready to listen to you. And so, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Speak to us individually right now because we have our hearts and our minds open to what you want to say to us. Oh, Jesus, it's such a privilege and an adventure to follow you. There's no life like following you. Thank you for the life that you have given us. We thank you this morning for the salvation that you have brought about in our lives. Thank you for saving us from our, our brokenness, from our sin. Thank you for drawing us into the kingdom of your Father. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to guide us, to empower us, to counsel us, to lead us in this life that we live. And we depend on you, Jesus, every single day for everything. We want to follow you wholeheartedly, Jesus. We depend on you in that regard. And so speak to us. Guide us even for the rest of this day. We want to honor you in the words that we say and the way that we conduct our lives. And we want, to, we want to just bring others to know you like we know you. So thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done. And continue to guide us as a collective church, body, a family of people together on this adventure. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for what you've done in each and every individual's life here. Continue to do your good work in us until we meet you face to face. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance, his glory upon you. May he give you peace by his spirit. 
in all that you do and all you experience this week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for listening. We hope this message has impacted you. We'd like to challenge you to take it one step further and get connected. For any questions or prayer, please visit our website at cschurch.ca. You can also like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter.